So, hello everybody. Hello again. Um, we're now streamed online. So, very warm welcome to the online community, to the virtual room. We're here in the city of Berlin, nice weather outside, at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, which was so nice to provide the space for this conference named Central Banking and its Discontents, the Role of Monetary Policy in Contemporary Capitalism. So what we've already started in the morning, and we had, what we're going to do in the next three days, is discuss all the different, or many, not all, but many different aspects of central banking, banking political economy of central banks, and the overall politics behind this issue in contemporary times. Yeah. Um, we will have Katarina Pistor in a second, but just want to say that in the next days we, there will be some more live streams. Yeah? Uh, tomorrow we will have Mark Blythe in the morning, 9.15, Central European time. Then Daniela Gabor at half past two tomorrow. And um, Paul Tucker on Wednesday morning quarter past nine, and round table at 2.30 on Wednesday. So for those who join, join online, you're very much welcome to follow these discussions. And in between, we have our sessions here discussing a lot on central banking. But now we have Katarina Pistor. I am super happy to get to know you because we haven't met before. Uh, of course, I know maybe one of your most important publications, The Code of Capital, which uh, was a super success for good reasons, I would say. I'm super glad that we have you. Um, coming from Columbia Law School and bringing in a very important law perspective in the field of political economy. Yeah? Um, I won't count all your publications, but you're well known. I would say you're kind of a star currently, also for good reasons. So the floor is yours. I'm super happy that we, we're having you. And um, please. Thank you very much for this very kind welcome. I'm delighted to be back in Berlin. I haven't been here for, I don't know, three years or so. So it's, it's great to be back. It's also very nice to be at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which actually did the first German um, book event on my book, um, even before it was translated into German. So um, thank you for that as well. Um, I wanted to uh, present you um, some ideas that I have about money and central banking. I'm not really an expert in central banking, but I did write a paper in 2013, which was part actually of an INET-sponsored research project um, on uh, the legal theory of finance, it was called A Legal Theory of Finance, where I started the ideas that later on um, were more um, uh, were refined and, and deepened a little bit in the, in the code of capital. And that is basically that our financial slash monetary system is coded in law, as I would now say, it was constituted in law, and that we have to understand the legal structures to understand basically how it works. So the, the core argument that I will be presenting today is that um, the foundations of capitalism are both law and money, and money for me in my, legal, my, my world is also a product of the law, and that capital is essentially the private appropriation of these social resources, because money system and legal systems are social resources, and you create capital effectively by appropriating, uh, privatizing, if you want, by appropriating these social resources. And the second point I want to make is that the basic pattern, especially when we look at the money slash credit system, has been the same over and over and over again. We're seeing the same pattern. I think we can also make predictions. One of the predictions I would make is that the tightening of the central banks won't last very long. Once you see a hiccup, um, uh, when, once they, the, the financial markets throw a tantrum, as my husband, who is a pediatrician, would say, the central banks will yield again. That's what they have always done, with very, very few exceptions. <clears throat> 
Um, the basic pattern, I will say more about what these patterns are, what the structures are, but, but eventually we, we see expansion of money and credit cycles, we see a crisis, we, say, we see interventions, and then we typically see the normalization of the crisis interventions in post-crisis time, which basically means that one of uh, Minsky's, what I would call Minsky's laws, Minsky's prescription for how to deal with financial crisis is that you offer a lot of liquidity in the middle of the crisis, and then once the crisis has subsided, you intervene and you avoid uh, uh, all the mechanisms that have led to the crisis in the first place. That never happens. Never, ever happens. Instead, we normalize the crisis intervention and then just enter into the next cycle. And I think that's what we just have to understand. Otherwise, we don't understand why it's so hard to get out, and we also can't seriously think of in, um, alternatives. Okay. So this is just basically a, a quasi-graphic um, representation, representation of, of what I just said with a little, um, a, a few additional elements. One is that a lot of the expansion in the original credit cycles, uh, the extent, extension of the expansion of the money supply, um, happens through processes of legal arbitrage, about which I will say a few more um, in, in, in a little bit. Um, you, the markets expand, you get a crisis, you get crisis intervention, you get normalization of the intervention mechanisms in good times, you get new products that now try to get, if there are some new restrictions, because very often in response to a crisis, some restrictions are put in place, you get new legal arbitrage around them, and then you enter the entire cycle again. You expand, you support um, a crisis, you, um, and, and um, even if there are restrictions implemented after the crisis, that they never really invalidate the structures and patterns and mechanisms that have, that have left, led to the crisis in the first place. So just to give you a few examples, even though we're talking, you know, in the, I think in the end we want to talk about contemporary situations, but we also want to talk, talk about history and structures. Um, I just um, uh, took um, Stefano Ugolini's book on uh, the history of central banking to just put together some materials on crisis past, and you will see the pattern right away because it sounds really like our contemporary crisis. So in 1763... Major banks extended loans, of course, at the time, or I should say private to 1763, the major banks, including uh, banks that we today would call central banks, um, extended loans exclusively to governments, uh, for government or government-sponsored entities, such as the big trading companies at the time. And you can look at sort of the Banco del Giro, the Banco de San Giorgio, the Wiesel Bank in the Netherlands, the Hamburger Bank, or the Bank of England. And of course, then some banks did what banks have always done. They basically um, uh, fund themselves domestically um, with uh, short maturity loans and then issue long um, ma ma maturity assets elsewhere. And at some point, they get caught in between because they have a liquidity problem. And what do you do then? So you have a major cri a crisis in 1963. The mar bill market freezes. There's a major demand for Visa Bank deposits. And what does the Visa Bank do? It responds to the demands and opens basically its doors to those who are seeking safety at the Visa Bank um, and tries to expand the el eligible collateral. And that's, of course, what we see in 1963 and beyond as well. Bank of England does the same. Most other major banks at the time do the same thing. And then the critical next step is post-1963, the Bank of England discounts bills to private um, parties um, also in normal times. Basically, the shift from um, supporting the public debt markets to the supporting the private debt markets happens relatively early on. And that's basically, if you want, the original sin. We very often today think the original sin is to lend to governments, but, but that was what they were supposed to do. Uh, the original sin is then to expand this to the private sector and treat the private sector eventually almost as if they were also like governments. And that sort of changes, I think, the power dynamics um, in this entire game. Then you can go on, you go to the crisis of 1895, where we have um, um, sort of a reversal of an earlier expansion mode, and very often expansions happen also because of historical circumstances. You get the Napoleonic Wars, you get the suspension of the gold standards, everybody ex is expanding. Then in England, you go back to the gold standard in 1821, and of course the Bank of England has to tighten, tighten its discount policy, which precipitates a crisis. What happens next? There's a run on cash. What happens next? The government basically suspends the law and says, actually, um, you can now um, um, sort of 
again, add as more more um, um, nodes into circulation. The bank makes a complete uh, U-turn and uh, restarts uh, discounting small denominated um, bank notes. Um, the private sector is a little bit unsure now whether it can always rely on these major banks and so creates its own private solutions, bill brokers. We call them private dealers today. But these private dealers ultimately, of course, also depend on the liquidity provisioning of a central bank. So it's a partial solution. It works until they run out of cash and they run out of liquidity provisioning. And private um, entities, as I've um, argued in several pieces earlier, um, private entities, of course, have a binding survival constraint. Minsky would call it this, or a hard budget constraint, as Janusz Kornheit might say, which basically means they can't really support the entire market. The only entities that can support entire markets and can really provide high-powered monies are public entities. Um, and so you always go back to the public entities in the end, even if we find private solutions, which can be clearing houses, which can be uh, bill brokers, which can be private dealers. In the end, they're only stopgap measures to finally go back to the public. And then you get to the crisis of 1847, and don't worry, I will not go through too many crises, but to just to show the pattern, I'll stop. After this one, you have the Bank Charter Act of 1844, which basically says, we want the Bank of England to be a powerful private bank and uh, relieve it a little bit of its public mandate. It should compete with the private banks, which it does. And in the process of being an aggressive, aggressive competitor, fuels the expansion, again, of the financial system, which then results, of course, at some point into a rising default rates. You get the classic liquidity shock. And what does the government do? It lifts the limits on banknotes circulation. The Bank of England accommodates the assets that need to be discounted now, and that's at the time what a budget and the econ and the economy is putting to campaign for regularizing the loan of, of last resort bonds. Right. So this is now we basically have the next step. First you incorporate the private debt markets into the public accommodation policies. Now you're basically normalizing lender of law of last resort policies and you have the bank of England much greater puzzle, the, the really interesting step, I think, is the creation of the American Federal Reserve System. Um, um, this is what um, Lev Menand has uh, sort of has invented the term, I think, but, but has sort of called the American Monetary Settlement, which predates, of course, 1913. It goes back to the 19th um, century, early 19th century, because in the United States, there had been a lot of banking regulation, not so in England. England did mostly ex-post accommodation, but not ex-ante regulation. In the United States, there was more ex-ante regulation. There was, and, and the idea was not to have powerful national banks. As you know, two of them were closed down um, because their charter was not extended, but to have thousands of privately owned banks that were chartered mostly by state governments, of course, during the Civil War, increasingly also by the federal government. They were separated from commercial enterprises. They were controlled by state receivers or other executives, but they were also subject to overstate by either, either state, uh, by oversight by state or federal officials. So they were um, regulated in an ex ante fashion. Now, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was supposed to um, accomplish several things. Um, first of all, it was supposed to counter the deflationary effects that you see in the private sector, especially in the aftermath of crisis. You get a deflation into too little money, not too much, too little money, and you get the economic aftershocks um, thereof. And therefore, the idea was sort of that we can um, accommodate this or moderate this in one way, some ways with the Federal Central Bank of the kind that the Federal Reserve System was, which was not modeled on the Bank of England, even though most of the other European and also overseas central banks that were created in the 1920s or so were, or later, or were, were modeled on the Bank of England. Uh, the second major con concern um, was maldistribution or the concentration of power. Um, there was a lot of decentralization in the system, but there was also a lot of centralization in the system. The big financial centers, of course, were New York, um, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, but especially New York. And the New York banks were the ones that actually were counter that just a publicly governed um, Federal Reserve system owned by banks, so it's a hybrid system, but it's publicly government, governed. And then the, the, the third major concern was the lack of um, public accountability of, um, um, of these banking institutions, especially the big ones. So President Wilson at the time, the Democratic Party at the time, was actually thinking that finance, yes, is the lifeblood of commerce, and if that is so, then we should make sure that the public controls that lifeblood because we're all dealing 
So they claim the federal resources. But the puzzle is that in this land of regulation in the United States, which closed down two national banks, uh, which institutionalized a system for governing the money system, which was supposed to be democratic and publicly governed, we today have prices of the highest concentration of financial power and the United States occupies the atypical uh, uh, financial capital system. So, so, so that, that, that we have to explain because any attempt to maybe re-democratize or maybe democratize for the first time the supply of money has to learn that lesson. How did that happen? Why, why is it that the United States built in the end failed at doing what the world city sign wanted to do at least from the beginning? So there are several explanations for them, and I thought I'd just run through those that are currently sort of debated in the literature, and then I give you my own little spin on them, because um, there will be, as you can expect, a little bit more legal, although I have to say, Lev Menand, who is a colleague of mine now at Columbia Law School, we're very happy that he joined our faculty at the beginning of this year. He recently published a book, which is called The Fed Unbound. Um, Lev calls himself a public lawyer, an administrative lawyer. Um, he worked at the Treasury for some time. Um, he um, is, is a super smart lawyer, knows um, the inside out of the federal system, uh, the fe uh, federal reserve system and the treasury really, really well. He basically argues that this uh, monetary settlement of 1913 sort of worked for a time, but was actively dismantled after World War II. Um, one of the key people who participate in the dismantling of the system was um, one of the um, chairmen of the, the, the then chairman of the Federal Reserve, William McChesney Martin, who was um, uh, uh, who worked at or was a partner at a broker dealer before he became the chairman of the New York Fed and then eventually of the governing, governing board. And what he did is he offered basically liquidity support to private dealers which was not within the mandate of the central bank, which was pointed out by Congress, or rather the Banking and Finance Committee, at Congress said that this is contra legum. So then they tried to lobby Congress for legal support to change the law. That never happened, and they did it anyhow. So we had a legal rule that was con a constraint, in principle a binding constraint, that was simply ignored, and nobody was enforcing it, because, of course, the Fed enforces its own rules and doesn't have a lot of um, legal, legal oversight. And Congress, in the end, just was sitting um, uh, maybe asleep at the wheel or did have too many conflicts to really intervene. And to the contrary, in 1991, after a major, another major financial crisis in the United States, Congress loosens the restrictions on the Fed's lending policies and allows it to also give non-bank entities emergency loans. So it basically follows in lockstep, maybe a little belatedly, um, the kind of measures that the Fed itself has introduced earlier. Um, other things that Lev Menand points out that have resulted in the system in the Fed unbound, as he calls it, uh, the perversion, if you want, the turning upside down the, um, mon uh, the, the, the monetary but also political settlement of money in the United States of 1913 was the support for the euro dollar market that, of course, emerged already in the 50s or 60s. Um, but then when it also um, um, hit some brick wall, some crisis, um, uh, basically offering the central banks um, unlimited access to dollars so that then they could pass on these unlimited those dollars to entities within their jurisdictions that needed dollars to pay their bills. And the third big element that he identifies, and I think many others who have studied the US history will point to similar structures, were the money market funds which the SEC tolerated. They were basically created under the Investment Act of 1940 that also regulated investment vehicles outside the banking sector, but they're always to what the law cannot regulate, and they were able to set up these investment entities that basically bypassed some of the restrictions uh, that had been put in place, and the SEC let it, ha let it happen. So Labs basically argues we have a system in place, a governance system that had a particular idea of a monetary settlement in mind that was structured for this, and our inability to currently govern the system that we have has something to do with the schizophrenia of having a system that was designed for a particular um, outcome and that was um, um, that was then dismantled later on. So that's Lev Lev's um, argument. Now let's turn to uh, Perry Merling, also of course uh, well known among the YSI crowd, or certainly INET. His book, uh, The New Lombard Street of, two, uh, of 2011, he basically argues that 
the system that was put in place in 1913 not only did not ever work, because it couldn't work. There was World War I, if you remember, then there was a lot of turmoil in the 20s, and there was a depression, and then there was World War II. So it, we don't have the counterfactual where there, you know, had nothing happened in 1913, it would have ever worked, but he basically argues it could have never worked. Because the system was designed basically by lawyers in a top-down fashion, trying to reimagine a system that worked according to very different rules. So he argues the, the US financial system was deeply imbricated uh, between money systems and the capital markets. And the whole idea was not so much like, like in England, you have the bills of exchange and you have to you liquidate them and you can um, try to channel the liquidation to certain types of entities. But the whole system was built on the notion of shiftability. You have to be able to shift your assets into other assets that might be safer. You go into the capital markets, you go, go out of them. And if you have a liquidity problem, somebody has to provide that liquidity. That's what the Fed has to do if the private um, broker dealers themselves run out of money. So he's basically saying the structure of the financial system that had already emerged by the time that the Federal Reserve System was put in place was such that it couldn't simply, simply be redesigned. And then even to the contrary, I think he argues, saying that the legal restrictions put in place by the Federal Reserve System on top of that, that of course, emerged in the early 1930s, created new legal arbitrage opportunities, which, of course, the financial system will exploit. And then they, 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 they tried to get around it. swap arrangements so that you can always make sure that the dollar or the British pounds or whatever currency stays within the country even though the subsidiary or foreign parent company needs it in the other jurisdiction. So you can get around all of these restrictions. He shows you how um, financial entities have done that and basically says they escaped the restrictions that were put in place. And of course, the same mechanisms that were invented then to escape these restrictions, when you take them offshore, you basically onshore them later and then bring back these practices to um, the home country and you use them to create other stuff, such as um, uh, derivatives or other, other new structured financial um, um, mechanisms. And then there's a third um, strategy for explaining the tuzzle, puzzle, that is uh, Stefano Ugolini. He's more um, a, a, of a historian, but I think he, you know, his institutional comparative analysis is really quite compelling to understand um, how central banking, um, the multiplicity, of course, of different functions that we add up as central banking have evolved over time in different um, markets. Um, he basically says um, the invention of central banking is a response to the need of public entity states to fund themselves through debt markets and to mitigate the effects this has on the markets because, of course, the states are the largest borrowers. Um, and so to minimize the distortions, we create um, um, some kind of um, mid, um, intermediaries such as these uh, central banks, the Bank of England, the uh, uh, Bank in, in Sweden, etc. Um, but, but of course, private actors are not static. They respond to the new opportunities that these new mechanisms create for them. So that in the end, what we get is that increasingly the central banks not only monetize public debt, they increasingly monetize private debt to the point that he says in his own book that by 1825, the Bank of England had become indispensable for the private lending market. Right? It's been part and parcel of the private um, lending market. Um, uh, monetary stable, uh, stability becomes deeply intertwined with financial um, stability. We can't separate them anymore. That happens both internally and ex externally, though in different ways in different uh, countries or places. And that has a lot to do with the origin, this institutional origin. So he's, he's, he's arguing very strongly for institutional path dependency. It also has a lot to do, um, of course, with the political economy, the, the actors in place. Okay, so, so what, what's my own take on that? So, so um, I'm a lawyer like, like Lev Minat, my, 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 my colleague, and I learned a lot from him. But also my focus is more on, on the private law. And, and those of you who have read the Code of Capital, in the book I explain a little bit how private actors can actually use the law very creatively to accomplish a lot of things. They're using this social resource, as I called it earlier, to create um, uh, basically capital and, and their own private wealth. So, if we think about um, uh, the, the two major social resources of capitalism, law furnishes the mod modules, as I call them, the institutions, the private law institutions from which you can code capital. They must be backed by some centralized powers of coercion to really work effectively. You might turn to a different state's 
coercive powers to enforce some, some interests, and we have created mechanisms, legal mechanisms, that make this possible, so it doesn't have to be the same state. And the more we open this up, of course, the more flexibility people have to take the laws from one jurisdiction to have them enforced in another one and build um, a legal system to their own liking in that fashion. Money works exactly according to the same principles. Money, in my view, is another capital asset. It's basically for credit money in particular. You have um, a pr private credit that is coded in very similar ways that fuels investments, and that has to be backed in the end by public resources because otherwise these markets crash as the crisis scenarios that I talked about um, showed, showed to you. Um, one just cautionary note before we go on, I just wanted to reiterate here already, is that law, money, and capitalism itself all predate democracy, right? They were incorporated into democratic political systems without ever being changed in that process. They were basically naturalized within these systems, and I think one could also safely say, say they have never been democratized. Right? And, and, and so, so that tension just continues with us, and I frankly don't really have a, a way out, but let me, let me just continue just to, 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 to develop my argument here, and then maybe in the Q&A we can think of uh, solutions together more creatively than I've been able to do on my own. So those of you who have read the book or heard me talk about this before, these are just, uh, just a, um, the, the, the modules of the Code of Capital, the private law institutions that are so malleable that you can actually use and you make new things out of them. Property law, collateral law, trust law, corporate law, contract law, of course. Bankruptcy law is a little bit of an outlier because bankruptcy to this day is mandatory law. So you don't have quite as much um, ability to manipulate or to change it. Over time, usually you need uh, legislative intervention, right? So the bankruptcy safe harbors that made it possible to uh, do close out netting for um, derivatives, et cetera, uh, or repos, that these were legislative interventions. Interventions. You couldn't do that without it. But many of the other creatures that we have made, um, you know, many of the special purpose vehicles are trusts. Um, many of the assets that were created, you take a trust and you dress it up in certain ways. You create an inter internal contractual structure that stratifies claims that people have to that. You can all do this in private law without having to ask anybody for approval. You just do this on the assumption that this will be legal. The key is for, you know, you take these, you basically take these modules of the code of capital, and you graph them onto different assets, including, of course, financial assets. So from the perspective of financial assets or private money, the key is convertibility, by which I don't mean convertibility into gold. Right? So for people in the monetary world, that's a, sometimes a bit confusing. But the ability to flip them into cash, mostly to, to save assets ultimately into cash. You want to have basically central bank eligibility, because only if you can flip it back into cash can you protect the nominal value of your past gains because money doesn't lose its nominal value, as Morgan Ricks has nicely argued, but it may use its real value. We'll talk about inflation in a couple of days. Uh, but, but in times of crisis, the nominal value is kind of important, right? You can protect the nominal value of what you had made in the past. You lock it in for a while, and then you, once the markets have um, calmed down, you go out and do another round. So priority having better ranked rights than others is always uh, important. You get this through property rights. You get this through collateral law. So what counts, what counts as collateral, what you, ha you have to do to take out a collateral that all matters in the law. Durability is basically um, asset shielding, which helps you to create sub Category subparts, like different vessels of assets that are protected from one another, and each creditor has a right only against one of these vessels, but can't put his hands across one into another one. That's what we do with trust, with corporate law. And you can see this in the structure of financial intermediaries and also increasingly non financial intermediaries that have very complex. Uh, legal structures nowadays because they're trying to um, raise capital on the cheap by creating all these um, subsidiaries and sub, 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 subsidiaries and you see the whole mess then when they finally end up in bankruptcy. There was an interesting article today in the Financial Times, not sure some of you might have picked this up, that the bankruptcy in, in lawyers in the United States have to cut short their summer vacation because many of these companies are heading for the bankruptcy court. Um, convertibility already mentioned that's locking in past gains and then last but not least, what the law does, if you get a claim that is recognized in principle in the law, it basically means that everybody has to yield to that. It's not only between you and your contracting party, it's against ergo omnis, against the world. And as long as we can retain that facade that in principle we are creating rules that are binding on everybody, 
we sometimes exempt some people from something. I'll talk more about this in a second. But you still maintain the, the, the working of the rules and the enforcement of the law against everybody else. Then you have a fairly stable system, and that's what we want. We want to have that everybody else plays by the rules, but I get my exemptions whenever I, I need them. So what this all means is that private law, in particular the modules of the code of capital that you also need to create credit money, are highly malleable, much more malleable than most people assume who are not practicing lawyers. Even in law school, we are told that you know, um, uh, property rights are absolute. Sort of, but we can create things that look very much like property rights in many different ways as well. Um, as long as we have priority vis-a-vis -vis everybody else and we can enforce it against the rest of the world, we actually have something like a property right and we can create it if necessary through a contract. So we can use also these modules and graft them onto different types of assets. We develop most of them for land. We can now easily um, use them for financial assets and, and other intangible um, property um, rights. In fact, I think in our financial and intellectual property world, most of the valuable financial assets are themselves products of the law, which we then further dress up in the law. So that's the kind of legalized virtual world that we do live, live in. in. The fact that we can do this also gives us as coders um, and the asset holders that have good coders um, on their side a first mover advantage. Because I can code something and say, and, and say this is legal because it's close enough to something that has already been recognized or sanctioned as legal. And so the question is how far can you deviate every time that you do a new coding strategy? But the point is also, well, who challenges you? Somebody must challenge you, otherwise you can say it's legal. And either a competitor has to come and sue you, and then the competitor also faces the cost of doing that, or some regulator has to do this. And again, regulators also tend to be rather understaffed and under-resourced. So you have a powerful first move um, 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 advantage when you use the private law to code um, your, your assets. Um, and of course, once we open the world for uh, freely choosing uh, the law from doing different jurisdictions, and still finding ways to then use also centralized um, means of coercion of some state to enforce these claims. And we are in a world where private party can, parties can basically create their own legal systems for their own financial assets and intermediaries. And last but not least, once they can say, well, what we are doing is legal, because we did this with the law. Nobody challenged us. The regulators might even have approved it with you know, um, no action letters and so forth. Then. Of course, somebody has to help us out now. When we did everything was legal. Now we're in the middle of the crisis. Nobody is at fault, so somebody has to help us out. So it legit legitimizes, essentially, the protection that they're seeking in times of crisis. And another related point is to say, not only is law malleable, we can actually, and it's meant to be malleable. We want a decentralized process of adapting the law to changing circumstances if we want to have a decentralized organ economic organization. But another point that we also have to realize is law is, of course, incomplete. Um, contracts are incomplete, so economists around you will know that. And of course, law must be more incomplete than contracts because law is made to apply for many different cases and for long periods of time, not only for specific types of transactions. So what a, what a term in the, in, the, in, in the code or in the codex or in the statute really means can be disputed. What is a bank, right? We don't have... In most jurisdictions, we don't really have a functional definition of bank, but we define banks as something that used to be a bank institution at some point in time, which means you can easily get around it because you just do the same stuff, but not exactly as a bank, but as another intermediary. It's also interesting to note that in other areas, like in securities law, we do have a functional approach, and in banking, it was always resisted to have that, which means that if we do something that's not a bank, then we can do it without being regulated, and we should be fine. Um, so law is inherently incomplete, it can be more or less incomplete, the less um, the lawmakers can agree on what they want to regulate, the more incomplete law tends to be. But law can also be watered down by exemptions. Maybe you can agree on a, on a principle, that, but then you exempt certain people who have a particularly powerful lobbies. Um, legislators do this through safe harbors, not only in bankruptcy law, but also in others, you know, just exempt entire categories of actors or assets from certain uh, rules. Um, courts have always done this, especially the common law, the, the, the chancery courts in the English system by the law of equity, which can cut both ways. Sometimes equity law can be tougher than the strict rules of the common law, but it can also be um, equitable relief just out, out of fairness principles. We will um, um, basically give relief to either the, 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 the litigant um, or the defendant here. 
And then last but not least, of course, we have the central bank emergency powers that can be interpreted, and we have seen that in times of crisis again. In times of crisis, um, we see both legislators, central banks, and also regulators very often to suspend or relax or suspend the full force of the law exposed. So we are in a legal system, we want to have an orderly system, everybody should have um, some shared expectations with others, but we can also suspend uh, the full force of the law. We do this quite regularly through ad hoc legislation, bailing out not only through central banks, but by the government. With the support of the legislature, we have a lot of regulatory forbearance in types of crisis because regulators are afraid that they might precipitate or deepen a crisis if they do uh, enforce regulations at that point in time, and of course we have both um, Lender and as Perry Melling has called it, a dealer of last resorts. In response to changes in financial markets, the central banks are expanding the ammunition that they bring to bear to rescue the system. So, so where does this leave us? Um, I just want to step back a little bit. In the abstract I submitted to the conference, I basically said I was a little bit in the mode of Lev Menand saying, you know, we created a public system, a public mandate. Um, we have uh, maybe even the United States, even employment. and but by um, circumstances, the central banks end up to being always um, um, the liquidity conduits for the private sectors and are um, disregarding their other public mandates. And I think um, just working a little bit more for this presentation, I just feel that that's just too simple. I think we really have to understand the institutional structure of central banking, how it has evolved in tandem with the development of financial markets. Um, and, and I think the, the core of what I just want to bring across is, is, of course, true that these systems are all social constructs and that they are largely made in law. But this does not mean that we can just recreate them in law. These are two different things, and I think that we also have to understand the complexity. So I think there are two fundamental dilemmas that we have to come to terms with if we think about reforming the system. The first is what I would call the decentralization dilemma, and I think that's very prevalent when you think again about the United States case, where we want to have small banks, no big national banks, uh, democracy, etc. But of course, centralization can be dangerous because centralization always gives rise to potential abuse of power. Decentralization gives rise to regulatory or legal competition, which has one major advantage. It really gives people an alternative, not only, only having to get their rights enforced here, but they can also go somewhere else, or they can find better legal protection here rather than there. Um, Harold Berman, a legal historian, also a former Soviet law um, theorist um, who taught many years at Harvard, he actually wrote in his uh, book Law and Revolution that the decentralized or the competition of different legal systems in Europe in the Middle Ages, the church, the cities, the states, the feudal system, that competition between these different jurisdictions ultimately gave rise to something like the rule of law because it gave at least resourceful, powerful individuals the possibility to couch their claim, let's say, as a claim that they can bring to a church court if they can't defend it in, in, a, in a regular um, um, feudal, <laughs> feudal tribunal um, um, themselves. So, that kind of regulatory competition can be enormously empowering, but it can also, of course, produce the other side as aspect. It, it just gives the upside to those who know how to do legal arbitrage. And if you then exploit legal arbitrage to the end, you're actually accountable to no one any longer. And I think that's a little bit where we are. We've basically controlled the states, sort of the leviathan of the public power, and have empowered private um, parties by extensive opportunities of legal arbitrage, both in private law but also in regulatory arbitrage, um, which has come back to, to, to haunt us. They basically have no public um, accountability or control. Um, on the other hand, again, there's a lot to be said, of course, for decentralization. If you want to have an economic or social systems where people make their own choices about their lives, including with whom they enter into exchange relations, etc., you need a decentralized legal system. You need something like a private law system that adapts to circumstances in a decentralized fashion without having to have state approval. So in that sense, we're somehow, we, we're somehow caught in a system that can give rise sort of to, to the distortions, if you want, or the outgrowths of that system, but it's a kind of a logical outgrowth of a system where we put a lot of emphasis on decentralization um, and then also but stand behind that when that system blows up. I mean, the, what we don't, don't have is the courage to say when the crisis comes to let the crisis run its course. And of course, there are good reasons not to do so. Um, especially here in Germany, we know that in the 1930s we got fascism, the United States got its New Deal, but you really don't know what the outcome would be 
in either, in either scenario. The second dilemma I just want to bring out is what I would call the public interest dilemma. What really is the public interest when we talk about money and financial system? And, and, and not only who defines it, but sort of thinking about how it was the public interest uh, recognized in the long history of central banking. There was always the sort of a publicness in the discussion about we now have to uh, do emergency lending or we have to create a system that serves the public. But the public was, of course, not the general public, it was the public of the financial elites. That was um, the public, and I don't think that has ever really changed with, with finance and, and banking. Um, our money systems are elite systems, and they now are widely used by others as well. Um, there are some exceptions, um, cooperative monies, etc. but um, even the cryptocurrencies, I think, have um, shown us that it's not that easy to um, if, um, uh, uh, not be tempted by the possibilities that asset speculation gives you, even if you started out as a more anarchistic kind of venture. Um, the second point, which I would call a public interest dilemma, is um, the m m multiple entanglements that relate to the financial and monetary systems. Um, the payment and the credit system, right, are deeply entangled, have been deeply entangled for, for, for centuries. And we rely very much on payment systems. So if the credit system goes belly up, we might also lose our payment system. The financial system, the monetary order, I mentioned this before, are deeply um, entangled. The retirement system is now completely financialized in many countries, which is also why you basically have the public on your side if you want to bail out and protect the financial system. So given, even just from a political economy point of view, where is actually the public that will allow us to take measures or think, rethink fundamentally how we want to structure the financial system, given this deep entanglement, this has become increasingly difficult. And then last but not least, again, with globalization and the opportunity to easily shift accounts to different uh, jurisdictions and assets around, um, the opportunities for regulatory legal arbitrage are such that it's very difficult to get a handle of what's over what is going on. So what are, what are the implications? And, and I hope that this will be a bit provocative. Um, the first is just to recognize that the um, global monetary slash financial systems that we have today are effectively ungovernable. We try to govern a little bit, but they are, as, as, the, as, the, as the system stands, there are Ungovernable. I, I should give credit here to uh, Renate Mainz. Uh, he used to be one of the directors of the Cologne Max Planck Institute here. We had a meeting at the Brandenburg Berlin Academy of Science a couple of years ago and talked about the financial system. And she basically said, at the end of the day, this is an ungovernable system that we have created. It's man-made. Doesn't mean it's made with institutions that are legal institutions, political institutions, but it's essentially ungovernable. Central banks operate, I think uh, factually this is right, um, they operate as liquidity conduits to keep the system afloat. They sometimes do this reluctantly, sometimes maybe more proactively, but in the end, they hardly have a choice. The only choice is to ste step out and let the system crash. And I think there are conservative bankers and are very fearful to do this. And when, again, history tells us that this is also not an easy decision to make. I said at the outset, I think if we, if we think about the patterns of bank, uh, central bank accommodation of financial markets. I do not, you know, there are lots of speculation now what will happen when they tighten, how this will affect markets. Well, I think once the markets um, bark, they will probably backtrack as they have almost always um, done. And then last but not least, I would say, if we want to have a different monetary settlement, if we want to go back and say, you know, 1913, if we want to change the system um, and create better public governance, then just creating the public governance alone won't do it. We have to create the system underneath. We have to change the system underneath. And changing the system underneath basically has to say, we have to have a different monetary slash financial system, and that basically also means we have a system that has to be different from the capitalist system that we have um, today. Uh, how this would look like is, Again, also incredibly difficult to say. As I mentioned before, the decentralization dilemma suggests to you it's also not easy to say we just centralize more, we decentralize more. Both have its major pitfalls, um, as, as does the public interest dilemmas that I, that, that I mentioned um, earlier. So let me stop here so that we have a little bit of time for discussion. Again, I, I thank you for, for listening. Use a mic, I think, because of the streaming. Yes.
It's a very insightful talk. As a non-lawyer, I have the question whether it makes a difference whether you talk about common law in the United States and the Roman law in Germany. And as a political economist, I have a little comment on the issues of the liberalization of finance in the United States. I believe one really has to see that a specific settlement, Bretton Woods, had uh, certain preconditions that were not met over time, and that is the balance of payment problem. And then the regulation of interest rates had the problem that it ran into inflation issues. And then uh, the issue of uh, the competition of Germany and Japan undermining the price setting power of, uh, of American conglomerates and thereby giving more power to Wall Street. So I think these kind of developments have to be thought of too. Yes, no, no, thanks, thanks for that. Let me just start with the first one. There is a difference between common law and civil law systems and the, the Roman influence. I think it is, has become less pronounced over time, which is a result of our global competition and also harmonization to some extent. But there is still, I think, the one of the uh, most striking differences to this day is that the civil law systems, because of the Roman tradition, police the boundary between contract law and property law more strictly than the common law countries do. This is um, how um, uh, Giuseppe Dari Mattiacci, who teaches at Amsterdam um, Law School, put it once, and I think he's absolutely right on that. So the, the quintessential example in the common law system is the trust, where you use basically a contractual structure to alter property rights without following the laws of property rules. And property rules is basically, it, that that's the quintessential state law. Who has title to what is something that state law does. When you can shift that through property law, you basically are shifting grounds. And this is still much, much harder harder in the civil law system, which is why some countries like Switzerland have adopted the trust through an international treaty, or others advise their clients to then use the common law, because you can choose and pick and choose the law from different jurisdictions, which is why in global commerce and finance, these things don't matter so much anymore, because if need be, you just issue your assets in London rather than in Frankfurt under English law rather than Frankfurt law. It doesn't work for everything, but that's, that's a partial answer. But there are still important differences. The other points are also well taken. Yes, um, uh, history intervenes. I mentioned World War I, World War II, the Depression. Of course, the, the big global monetary settlement, if you want, after World War II, the Bretton Woods Institution, left its marks on the new monetary order. Um, and so did, of course, the American ambition to be a global power and have military bases everywhere and launch wars in Vietnam and Korea and need, needed the finance to do so. Plus, of course, the growing economies in Europe that were becoming more competitive. I think the key point from the political economy view that, um, that you mentioned is that um, in the global arena, many governments become their, the advocates of their private sector, whether it's the financial sector or the productive sector, which means that they will um, uh, backtrack on the regulations that they might put in place for whatever reasons back home, stability, progress, um, and also democracy, but they will relax that in the global context. And then you get the outsourcing, the offshoring, and the reverse onshoring again, and you're undermining public control in this fashion um, back home as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. It was great. Uh, I just have a quick question about the pattern you identified at the beginning of there being a crisis and then an intervention and then normalizing those intervention tools. And I just would invite, I'd love to know what you would think and your reflections, particularly in light of sort of a few of the comments at the end of the presentation on what seems to be uh, perhaps a counterexample in the US with the recent interventions, you know, for municipal bonds and Main Street facilities, which seem like they're going to disappear pretty quick um, after the after the, <laughs> the crisis, and sort of yes. maybe what that counterexample might tell us. Yeah, good point. So, what is being mainstreamed, of course, is the key question, right? And and so far, we have we have seen, I think, historically, far fewer interventions that were be went beyond the financial intermediaries that were directly affected by the crisis. So the, those interventions were, I think, kind of unique. And I think one can also question how effective they were, given 
the way they, they were structured. But I, I doubt that there will be, um, I mean, there was a lot of political opposition right away. The Republicans were very much against it. They were fearing that the, you know, all the municipals, municipalities go out of bound, bound and, and um, you know, and, and are not financially disciplined anymore. So, I, so yes, the point, of course, is we have mostly, historically speaking, um, normalize those that those measures that have, have helped the financial sector expand, not necessarily helped other institutional structures stabilize. Uh, thank you so Sorry. much for such a rich uh, presentation. Um, I was really struck by your note that uh, law and money have never been democratized and that they predate democracy in some important sense. And I was struck by it because I... <clears throat> I was thinking about national budget laws and the, the fiscal authorities, which of course are, uh, are not necessarily monetary in the way that we would understand it, but of course in historical context they were. The Bank of England was authorised annually through every budget law that was voted on by the National Assembly from the mid-18th century until 1968. Um, and even the Federal Reserve, there was um, you know, annual authorisations of direct credit lines from you know, 1942 until 1981. And, and, you know, I was in conversation with Eric Monet on this topic uh, last week, and uh, you know, he, he made the point that there's been a, a sort of uh, a kind of statutory simplification of monetary, of public monetary organisations in the last sort of 30 years, and it coincides neatly with the financial turn more generally. Um, and so I, <clears throat> it's more, more just a, an invitation to, I, I suppose, reflect on money and law do predate democracy, so do lots of things, um, and uh, they're not necessarily democratised in all of their aspects, but there's identifiable variations in that story throughout time. Yes, there are definitely um, uh, variations over time. I mean, I should also give credit to, to, to some other authors. One is Jonathan Levy, who wrote in his book, um, Ages of American Capitalism. He just opens one chapter and says, America was capitalist first and then democratic. And you just, you know, you just pause and then you think, okay, that's almost true for almost every other country in the world as well. But it's an, an important point to recognize, right? Because that means something. You know, you can ask yourself, because very often we are, I think because of the, the post-war era, the so-called golden era, where it seemed that the public had gained control, we always do as if it has gotten away again, but there was just only this brief interim. You can also ask the question, why did capitalism ever allow democracy? How does, it, does democracy serve that system, right? I think that's an important question to ask. This also goes in part to your, um, uh, to, to your question in terms of, yes, there was lots of um, you know, statutory uh, reenactment for the Bank of England, but whether or not you call England demo democratic at that time when you still only the landlords have voting rights is also an interesting question. Of course, they will reinvigorate that institution if it helps the elites and the landed elites have a lot of money in the financial system as well. So, so there is a recreation of a system that supports them. I should, however, say that Christine Dessan, who teaches at Harvard Law School, also sort of a lawyer who looks at money and financial systems, um, she basically creates you know, things of money as a democratic means and, and uh, describes the history of money creation in England as a deeply intertwined political story where you have to have a settlement between the private money users and the government so you don't get delusions, you have the real value of, of the money even before you have fiat money when you, when you still mostly use, use coins. And I think this is all true as well. What, what I'm basically looking at is, the, um, is, is credit money and credit system and the entanglement of credit money and credit systems. And, and I think that our money today I would characterize as credit um, money. And given that um, financial intermediaries can create credit money out of thin air, you don't have to be a bank anymore to do so. You can just be, um, you know, you can disintermediate, disintermediate these change in the shadow banking system. Um, and that we can no longer control. To that we can only react, right? So there might have been brief interims where we had control over a central banking institution, but we never had control, I would still maintain, over the entire money system. And we never had control over the entire legal system. In theory, yes, the legislature, the parliament could have always come back and invalidate certain practices. But first of all, they didn't even know about them because they happen in law firms somewhere. You don't have no idea what's going to happen. The only way you can find out is if you litigate. Nowadays, we allow everybody to go to, to private arbitration where nobody knows what's happening there. And the courts enforce, but the courts can't review the merits. So we're having basically a system where you have access to the centralized means of coercion for enforcing your claims without 
much, if any, public um, oversight, certainly not ex ante and less and less exposed. It's a system that just runs on, on, on its own. Um, and, and yes, the central banks, if, let me just put it this way. If you took the central banks out, the system would collapse. But well, we need the backstopping function. But the backstopping function increasingly becomes one where the central banks have little choice because of what is at stake. Uh, yeah, I have two questions about uh, governability. The first one is the relationship between central banks and courts. Courts have no issue judging central bank except when it comes to monetary policy, right? We often see cases in banking supervision, internal uh, resources and so forth and so on in front of courts, but never ever, at least in a subs with a substantial review uh, in front of courts. Do you have any explanation why judge seems to freeze and say, oh, it's so technical, I cannot have any opinion? So that, that is the first question. And why monetary policy and not banking supervision? I mean, for me, it's even worse public super banking supervision in terms of technicalities. So that would be my first question. My second question, and uh, coming back to Eric Monet, so there were times, even in post-World War II, where money was a bit governed, but it looked like you know, it works well when your elites are homogeneous. They are, you know, this white male factory worker uh, type. And do you, do you have any perspective on how we could rebuild this kind of circuits, but in a 21st century way? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we can come come back to the um, re rebuilding um, later. I'm just sort of um, trying to get back to your to you, to your first question. Can we just give me a br brief reminder what you what the, the first question was? Why, send, why court? Uh, oh, the courts. Sorry, I got yeah, it. I got it. The courts. courts. Well, first of all, the, you, you, the courts need to have jurisdiction. They don't. They can't hear everything. Courts are very limited organizations. You have jurisdiction. So, for the European Central Bank under the European Treaty structure, they are justiciable. Which is why, I would say, unfortunately, <laughs> the German Constitutional Court said, thought it would have some, something to say. And the German Constitutional Court thought it would have something to say about the. European Central Bank only very indirectly because it assumed, given that what the parties had told it, that somehow the German budgetary authority was undermined if something went wrong at the ECB. And since this is part of our democracy principle, and the democracy principle is, of course, Justice Seibel is one of our in, you know, fundamental principles of the constitutional order that you can sue on. So getting to a court on the basis of monetary policy is really difficult. So under, under the U European treaty structure, you can sue the ECB. Typically, it could be another European body or a government. It was very unusual to do this through a constitutional claim in the United States. We don't have that, so that's why you don't see this in court. What they have in the United States, though, is that the chairman has to come to Congress and talk to them regularly. <laughs> they can be taken apart uh, by, by people but ultimately they govern themselves. They are insulated from political control because they have very long terms. Um, and that's how the whole idea is that you, you know, diminish influence of, the polit of politics over the financial system. That's part of the settlement that we have also created. The more democratic countries became, the more insulated central banks also became, which is an interesting co-evolution, which basically means that we have no control over the monet monetary system that affects us all. Um, how, how does central banking change with uh, more heterogeneous um, interest? Um, uh, you know, I think uh, I think that the, the core principle for me is you know democracy. Whether it's now white males or, or white girls or black, brown, yellow, other people. So the first thing is sort of do you respond actually to a broader public mandate? And I think the the, the history of the Federal Reserve Act, which was the first attempt by a central bank to do just that, suggests it's incredibly difficult to do. And that um, first of all, most of the players who participate in the governance themselves, certainly in the United States, but in other places as well, are recruited from that system. Those are the ones who do money. So Martin was a quintessential broker dealer, then went to the chairman of the Federal New York Fed. That's a classic career pattern. And then you go to the board of governors. Exceptions prove the rule. Bernanke was a professor. So you, know, you always get some, some others, but you get a lot of practitioners um, there as well for good reasons. And of course, they, they, they recreate a particular uh, system. So the, 
you know, the Employment Act of 1946 in the United States, which says there's also, you, you have a broad mandate and it's, it's basically a stable monetary system, including price stability, but not the only one, and including um, a full employment. The employment side has never been taken very seriously. It's always the first thing that gets compromised. Um, and by in interpretation by the major, major players inside that institution. And I also think that they have much more feedback from the financial sector than they get from the rest of us. Uh, that's Annalise Ryle's points as well, as well. She has written a book where she says, how could we democratize? How can the central banks become part of a broader public um, life? And of course, it would make their life a lot more complicated. And I'm not sure how many of them are serious about that. <laughs> It kind, kind of leads nicely into my question. Thank you, Katarina, for this. It was fascinating. I'm wondering about the analytical purchase of your concept of liquidity conduit, particularly because when I listen to you, with, with relationship to, the, to private law and with the emphasis on backstops, it seems to me that it constructs the central banks as sort of passive agents that eventually adjust under the financial lobby, whoever that is, or powerful interest event eventually adjusts to whatever the system needs to be kept afloat in a kind of ungovernable manner. But I think, for example, of uh, the ECB agenda on, on greening the financial system, and it doesn't seem to me that it fits so easily with the analytical lens that you're offering. I mean, I, I can't make sense of how your analytical lens of liquidity conduits, which is also parallel to me to the notion of financial intermediary that we use when we discuss finance. And I think it's, I usually stay away from that because it, it sort of negates, for example, the, the money creating power of, of commercial banks, also the shadow money creating power of, of, of shadow banks. So I'm, I'm wondering where, how analytically you make sense of, of political events or technocratic events where the, the public good is the, the first priority of the central bank that, of course, it, it, it kind of gets diluted by private interest, but not sufficiently. So if you look at the ECB announcement last week, I would say this is a central bank that puts pu the public uh, good first. It does it in the most complicated and politically painful for itself as an institution <laughs> way possible. And I'm trying to think through, OK, is this a liquidity conduit, really? Well. It's a, it's a great question. Let me just first say I share your skepticism about financial intermediaries. So what I want to say is the private sector is, is a money-making machine and they have the tools available to them for them to do so. Because they have the tools available to, to do so, they're not just intermediaries but money creators, that also forces the hand of the central banks very often in times of crisis. So I think, I think you, know, you saw the 1913 you know, Act, you see a creation even of a monetary union like the like a euro, you create different policy mandates. I think for me, the critical question is then always what happens in times of crisis, right? How important are these political mandates when push comes to shove? It's the same thing when you do, I don't know, ESG and inside of a corporation. You, we can do a lot of green talk, but when when we say so what what is at stake here if the you know if 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 the market is at risk what are the priorities that we then then have so i don't want to deny that sometimes they come out with new policy strategies i also don't want to deny or undermine hope that an organization such as the ecb given its relative independence not only from politics but also from the financial sector more, maybe more so than the national um, central banks could pursue a different agenda under the right leadership. I don't want to deny this. But what I would say is if you have a, too much of a friction between what the ECB is trying, the central bank is trying to do and what the financial markets are doing, there will come a point of crisis where you would have to see some realignment. Otherwise, the markets will crash. Um, and then the, so I, th I think, in my view, the, the, the central banks are not the powerful agents, I think, as um, uh, Pavlo sort of su suggested, some argue they are these all-powerful agents that can control everything. I think they are more in the service of a system that they themselves no longer control, although they sometimes try to steer it from the back. Economists will sometimes talk about the, the idea of monetary sovereignty, um, but it's always felt a little hand wavy. It's not immediate. It's not really clear sort of what they mean by it, or what the parameters of it, or what the definition is. Um, I would guess from your presentation that y you don't think that there is such a thing as monetary sovereignty. Um, is there a useful definition of that, and is it even a useful concept to think about? <laughs> 
So I've written a paper <laughs> on monetary sovereignty a couple of years ago, and where basically, I think it was called From Territorial to Monetary Sovereignty, where I actually argue in our financialized world, monetary sovereignty might be more important than territorial sovereignty, which of course also then questions our democratic um, institutions and capabilities to govern this. And the basic idea is if you, have, you are monetarily sovereign in my world, if you issue your own money, uh, issue your own debt and your own money as a state, and most of the financial intermediaries on your territory or for whom you are responsible also issue debt in that, in that currency, because then you have control. Then you can do the backstopping. Doesn't mean that you have full control about the entire, over the entire financial sector. These are two different issues. But if you are monetarily sovereign, you can at least decide whether or not to support the financial system for which you have some responsibility, even if you can't control it, right? That's, that's the key for me, if uh, you, you have the liquidity power, right? If, if you don't have your own currency, if you issue your own debt under foreign law or under foreign currency, you can't provide liquidity support. If most of your financial intermediaries um, raise their own debt in foreign currencies, you can't give them liquidity support without having a swap line to somebody else. Sovereignty means that you can call all these shots, and so you have very few monetarily sovereign countries in this world. The US, England, Japan, Canada, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, China. And then it becomes, it becomes a bit complicated because when you look at their debt structure, many other countries have to raise their debt or do this for cost reasons under, under foreign law or in foreign currencies. Thank you for the great talk. When I read your book, I know with this talk, I'm reminded of a quote that's increasingly doing the rounds from Frederick Jameson, which is, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. Uh, with that in mind, you touched upon this already, a short question. When people talk about democratizing finance, does that statement have any meaning? <laughs> the, and then this, the second one is, given the story, and it's a very systemic story, so Dana there was saying, you know, where are the points of agency? These, there are these are more than control valves, right? But your response is a very systemic one, which is actually the respond because there's a crisis. That's when you see the agency. Is permanent accommodation such a bad thing? I mean, if this is the only settlement that we've got, if this is the only order we can imagine, it seems to be that whenever we try and do something other than this, bad stuff happens. And it does seem to be the case that we can continually bail out things and there doesn't ever really seem to be a number at which it all goes wrong. So maybe this is not so bad. Well, it, it has. So on the first question, um, you know, is there something like democratizing finance where you have to... Comp I, I wouldn't say it's impossible to imagine a financial system that was democratic, but you would have to imagine a very, very different financial system than what we have, because ours is inherently hierarchical, and it doesn't respond to democratic um, accountability mechanisms, really. So um, not this system, I would say. And, and the second question, is it so bad? Well, it has major side effects. Major side effects include the major concentration of financial power in the hands of the financial intermediaries that made it through the last crisis, a lot of hardship for those who did not, because we're not rescuing the entire system. So the municipalities and the households that we tried to rescue during COVID that's an exception rather than the rule, but we typically stabilize the core of the system and let everybody else play by the rules of the game, which means they crash and have to rebuild. That has also political ramifications. It's, um, it stratifies um, um, as societies, it stratifies our political system, it pushes people to the brink, to extreme political positions, it creates inequality. So there are, I think, huge costs um, that we have to contemplate. We say, yes, we can bail out, we can stabilize again, we can just give them another round. But the cost of maintaining that system are substantial as well. So I think we, we, we need to at least mitigate that, even if we don't fundamentally alter the system. Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. And um, thank you for your amazing book as well. Um, I have a question about the, um, your argument on the relationship between state and capital. So maybe I will make you repeat yourself. But um, you argue in your book that um, the state basically uh, lends a hand to to um, to finance and uh, in order to um, create social stability and save capital and state ensures that capital gets to rule through law and I'm wondering how do you position your argument uh, within the debates concerning the retreat of the state versus state-led capitalism or the prominence of state intervention um, and my second question would be, you stress that the 
the two futures, two futures of private law as being highly conducive to capitalist, grow, na uh, capitalist growth, namely its indeterminacy and its malleability. Um, but how does that actually work? Like, how does law change at the expense of some, and sometimes it doesn't? So, how do, how do you analyze this, or how does this malleability actually? Uh, stay stable through time? That was also a question that I, yes. I found really interesting. Yeah, so what is the relationship between the state and the state apparatus, which can be the legal system, also the monetary system, and sort of the, the more decentralized uh, evolution of capital and the coding of capital, basically? Well, I think, it's, I think it's, it's a really important question. I think it's also really important to realize about our legal system. So many people think that the legal system is a top-down system where we have a constitution, we have a legislature adopts law, and then we play within the rules. So we all have binding legal constraints. Within those constraints, we allocate resources and play our game in the economy, or we do our social game. What I'm describing in the Code of Capital and what I'm basically saying here, the same is happening, of course, with our credit um, and monetary system, is that the players themselves can change the rules as they play. There's no umpire who's just observing fixed rules that don't change, but you're changing the rules as you play. Through practice, everybody follows the ball now in the same way, and then at some point the umpire says, well, that's a new rule that's now established. Sometimes by challenging something that people have always done, say, no, this is the new rules, and then you have it out, and who wins, wins. And you go to a, a court, right? So what you need to, sometimes, once in a while, you need to sanction or have recognized practices that are a little shaky, whether they're legal or not, we don't really know. So you have to go to court. And sometimes we get even staged cases where attorneys sort of you know, have a case that they bring to court so because they want to solve one legal issue so that for the next 10 years, they don't have to go back to that, to the court. So they will push it and then see whether they can get the outcome from a court, especially in the common law system, but also we have a kind of case law in civil law as well. Because if the highest court says something, everybody will look to the highest court and do the same thing by and large. So, there is, there is a decent, you have decentralized access to the means of coercion and to mechanisms to have practices in the world recognized and sanctioned in law through litigation, essentially. And when you, when, you, when you combine the two, you have a legislator that could, in theory, respond to litigation and say, we fix this now, we don't like what the courts do. But they, they don't have the time, the capacity. Something really big must happen that they do respond. Very often they respond because there are some lobbyists that suggest that you respond. So the response is mostly to correct something that comes out too rigid by the courts vis-a-vis -vis the financial or private sector. So there's a, there's a duality. <laughs> I mean, um, it's interesting that you ask this question because pa Pashu Khan is one of the um, uh, major th theorists of socialist law in the 1920s. He was liquidated under Stalin, but he basically says the quintessential feature of capitalist law is this duality, the public-private sort of the, the market state, that, that you can play them out against each other. That is sort of the, the, the quintessential nature of, of capitalist law, which is why you have these parallel systems and why you can exploit the incompleteness of the law in the private law. And you can use the private law to get around regulatory constraints. So we enact a new law. We might do this for financial intermediaries. You have to be a bank. We do Glass-Steagall. We separate investment banking from commercial banking. And then you set up an intermediary that could be you know, within the incompleteness of a particular regulatory structure. You set this up, the regulators say, fine, you use a new private law structure and you get around it. When I talked to some of the practicing lawyers in New York, they basically said you can moot any public regulation with these codes. It's just a matter of time. It gets a bit com more complicated every time, but you can always get around. Um, hi, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. So my question, it goes a little bit more broad than the role of central banks and actually the legislation or the jurisdiction they actually have. But I was really curious to hear your thought about the role of national public banks in, this, uh, in all of this story and if they have a room or space to maybe relax this both trilemma that, that you pose, the decentralization and also, of course, the public interest a dilemma because then you'll have a public entity trying to do something and so I will be curious to see what you have to say about that. Yes, um, yes. So, so there, there are there are more institutional variations than 
what I talked about um, even today, but they're also, and historically we've seen more variation than we see today because we have privatized many of the banks and um, not encouraged the creation of new types of banks um, only when we have to deal with some bad banks issues. So sometimes the states come in with guarantees, et cetera. But there's a whole, you could reimagine a system with many other different institutions, including publicly owned banks at the local, regional, or, or, or national um, uh, level, of course, also international level. Um, uh, so, so and, and if you, so I think the, 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 the contingency is here to make sure that they have a, a mandate and that you keep them on track of that mandate. So the governance question is whether they will do what you want them to do and then they could have a broader mandate and consider more um, policy objectives and um, try to, to, to manage them. The problem is when they, when they get mandates that they can't really um, fulfill both at the same time. So I'm thinking for, about, for example of the government sponsored entities in the United States like Fannie Mae that was created as a government-owned entity to revitalize the mortgage market after the Great Depression and the collapse of the housing market and was government-owned un until the 1960s. Then the government wanted to get it off the balance sheet because they had too much debt and had, had um, issues with trying to expand the housing market, which it wanted to do, but it didn't want to do it the way they had done it before. So now privatize this thing, but still gives it a public mandate. And so it has easy access to international lending markets and, um, and gets, landed, gets, uh, gets funding as if it was a government entity, but it's only government sponsored, privately owned. Private investors can make a lot of money. It helps fuel the entire mortgage boom and then the thing crashes. So I think that the, the, the core here is to understand in what is the environment in which they operate. It's a little bit so similar like the Bank of England in the 19th century when it was told to be a competitor with the other banks. But if you have a special mandate, you're not a normal competitor, then you should do things differently. You should not play on the same playground with other entities, right? So you have to think about how to set up a governance structures to make sure that they can fulfill a broader mandate, but they might not be as competitive and they should never be because they have other things to do. But if you hold them then to their feet to the fire to in competitiveness, then I think you ruin the entire system. Very shortly, how many hands we have left now? One, two. One, two, okay, then it's fine. Okay. Three? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Katarina, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, especially in relation to the end of your presentation, um, the legal theory of finance emerged as a critique of a crisis and uh, the role of uh, liquidity provision in a crisis that was like top down. It was at the core, it emerged at the apex of the system. Um, and it's about how liquidity provision helps uh, um, provides flexibility at, at the apex. Um, but now we are in a situation where the crisis is like bottom up. It's um, the, the nature of the, of the COVID crisis is, and it, get, that, that connects a little bit with the um, question on households and, uh, and how uh, pr liquidity was provided at the bottom. I was wondering, uh, what, I, I, even though I, I agree with what you're saying that, that, that they, the, the, the new tightening will be reversed as soon as systematically relevant organizational markets tumble. I agree with that, but also at, at this time, w won't that be really, really too late? Because the crisis, they will tumble, the crisis is emerging, emerging from the bottom. Yes. And so what, how, if at all, does that affect the legal theory of finance, if at all? I just... So, so I think the legal theory of finance was basically um, an inductive theory that basically tried to explain how the financial system works and what happens typically in times of crisis. At the end of that paper, I started developing an idea which I wanted to develop further, but I haven't really been able to solve the issue because I'm basically saying what we should have is some, ability, some mechanism that allows us to basically wave a wet, white flag on the periphery of the system when things go wrong so that the stress doesn't start building to the core because when it comes to the core, we will rescue the core, we let everybody go under, but it always comes too late. So we need early warning systems and response to early warning systems. And so you have to think about mechanisms that you would use um, that could, couldn't be easily abused <laughs> um, so that you don't get like just rescue me mechanisms that are basically moral hazard inducing kind of um, uh, um, subs subsidies. And uh, I discussed it also with a couple of colleagues and one of my colleagues says you need basically a randomized thing so <laughs> that you just randomize or help certain entities, but of course you want to hit those that are 
relatively more important than others because you want to stabilize the system or you want to make sure that you understand how a crisis at that, in that corner of the periphery might affect the core, so that's why you have to extinguish that fire. In order to be able to do this, I think our central banks or whoever governs the system would have to know far more than they can possibly know about how our financial system operates. Right. And, um, and this also goes back to, to your earlier part of the question, the, the COVID, how did we manage COVID? You know, I think one of the lessons, at least for me, was that our institutional structures are not well, well equipped to reach households and individuals. Just think, in the United States, it was just so glaring. The entire small business administration structure has been dismantled such that you can reach small business only through banks, but most many small businesses have no banks. And the banks didn't want to lend with them, or only if they got additional security from the central bank because they were afraid they might be losing money. So our only functioning structure to reach people in the United States is the tax authorities and banks. It's nothing else. And so you could either get, get the check from the IRS or you, um, or, or, or you have a bank account, and for the rest, not so good. So, so I think this also tells us what we need to have, to have functioning public infrastructures if you want to help people in crisis. So we can bail out all kinds of people. We could be much broader in types of crisis, but we also need to have and sustain and maintain an infrastructure to reach people. Thanks, um, Katharina, it's good to see you again. And congratulations on the, on the latest book. I know it's been a, a while, but um, I have a really um, conceptual question first, and uh, also it relates to the last, the last point you just made, how to reach people or how to reframe people. So the, it's sort of about, about CBD, CBDC, central banks, digital currencies. Uh, I'll start with that question. How, what sort of, um, how can we sort of create new circuits? Uh, what, to what extent, from a legal perspective, does that give us, like you said, reach, new circuits, and how would, uh, how would that play out in your mind, or how would that circuit be able to really uh, be closed in the way we want it? Uh, and it's, it's a payment system plus something else, plus, plus other things, so it's a really interesting concept. But I would like to relate that to a deeper conceptual question, which is something that's related in this room that we've discussed already, which is center periphery dynamics, the hierarchy, and you've talked about specifically with your paper, but legal hierarchies. Um, to what degree are these inherent? To which degree are these dynamics always going to play out to some degree? Um, or is this decentralization something we can really manifest and build? This is important from a development perspective to understand, okay, if your point is taken, how do we design development for a country like Brazil? Do we need to have a deep financial system that's sustained within that country, which means it's a finance-led sort of development, um, or can that be thought differently? And that would, I know there's a debate that also Daniela Gabor and is, is part of about how that development could be designed, but the center periphery problem, can we really get around that, or are we just shifting the problem to elites elsewhere or, or dynamics elsewhere, and they're whoever captures those, those dynamics? So that's relating to the inherent aspect of these dynamics. And I know that Perry Merling, for instance, would say it's inherent, inherent uh, uh, hierarchy. I would, wouldn't say he's saying that he wouldn't make this a, a clear point, but I think maybe your, your perspective could actually give us a lot more credence to this particular dynamic and how you see that. Yeah, so I think you know, what I find puzzling about the CBDC development is that here you have um, a, a new uh, technology that would allow you to cut out the middlemen and Everybody who has some say over this will not do it. You know, the central bankers just will not do it, with very few exceptions. I mean, Costa Rica, some are playing a little bit more with this, but but basically the you know the the BIS is saying, you know, we just basically use this mechanism plus, but we keep the banks, and that tells you something about how deeply entrenched our hybrid franchised whatever system is, it is it is imbricated and it helps so much the private sector and the public sector is not daring to basically employ a new technology where they could actually cut out the middleman from the payment system. We can we then have to think about credit system, who does the allocation, how complex is this, can they really do this? But you can also build capacities. You might not have capacities today, you can build them in the future. The fact that it's basically off the table as a serious debate at, at the major central banks, I find kind of scary. Uh, but they tell, it's telling. It's telling from a political economy point of view. Um, I know Paris, I've always wrestled with Perry's argument about the in, in inherently hierarchical uh, nature of our financial system. You know, basically you think about everybody is a bank, we have assets and liabilities, and you have somebody above you who has slightly bigger assets and liabilities, and everybody owns somebody else's, and all the way up to the central bank. 
On the other hand, I have to say, I think he, he has a point when he, you know, he wrote his book before Lev Minan did, but he has a point when he says, well, if the financial system is structured in this fashion, and it was, of course, structured in this fashion at a time when the country was not fully democratic yet, and et cetera, and had also a lot of, you know, external um, power increasingly, but if the system is structured like this, then the idea that you could superimpose a different structure on it is problematic. So we have to think about how to nudge the system or change it in ways that, that is more, more productive um, o over time. But I, I do believe that more decentralization is possible, but you need, you need centralized governance over decentralization to keep decentralization decentralized. Because the point I made when I talked about the dilemma of decentralization is that it gives you the potential for small players to become big and to become big outside a system that can control bigness and unaccountability in this kind of system. That's the, the arbitrage story that I was um, telling. So we have still, I think, politically, the mind frame, you know, we want to control the state and super powerful institutions. We don't want to have national banks. But through the back door, we are empowering the banks in New York. And they're, of course, playing the same publicity game to their own benefit. Um, and so if you then transpose these ideas, I think, to emerging markets, I, I've never been a great fan of, of, of arguments that says you have to get the capital always from outside. I think it makes much more sense. This is, again, monetary sovereignty. Do you want to be a monetary sovereign? Do you want to be, be able to take care of the people in your country? The idea that you should only get capital from the outside at terms that are dictated to you and have no other leeway to handle this sounds a little crazy to me. Now, there are costs involved. You might not get ca capital at the price that you would want if you say, I'm only borrowing in my own currency. But you have seen some shift. You know, Since the early 2000s, many emerging markets only borrowed in foreign currencies, US dollar and pounds, essentially. Some of that changed again. There's some give and take. Um, uh, and some countries insist that they will never do this. China doesn't ever budge on, on, you know, on, 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 on certain issues and will retain its monetary sovereignty. And that, you know, it's a big country, but other countries could do something um, similar. So yes, I would sort of encourage some monetary sovereignty as the foundation for a financial system that they can backstop themselves. And then think about different money systems, including using decentralized systems, uh, such as CBDCs that don't give the cream <laughs> to the intermediaries that you know, really can cut them out, at least of, out of some of the systems that are relevant. Just final question, and then and then we close up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, hello. Sorry, uh, Michelle Everson from Birkbeck University of London. I, I think possibly a too obscure legal theory question about about the private. Um, is it possible to say with the risk society approach that we've collapsed the public? I mean, you're talking about the private re-establishing itself, but could we could we turn that round and say the entire system, the risk system? The, the prudential system collapses the public into the private. So the problem is not the private fighting the public, is that we've dissolved the public. Can, is, or is that too simplistic? I, I think it's I think it's probably the logical end point, end point of what I'm saying um, because you know the, to the extent that we have basically financialized as the common buzzword that we use for this so many different relations and that basically have to abide by the rules that are set by the system our pension systems are every right so that that subjects individual citizens to the mechanisms of a market and economic system that is inherently the way it's structured today is hierarchical. That origin goes go back to the feudal system, as Bernard Rudden has argued um, already. So we have a kind of the original institutions that make this system are pre-democratic. We've never changed them. They have overcome and, and maybe, maybe um, embraced, um, turned down, <laughs> however you want to characterize it, our attempt to build a public democracy in between. Yeah, I think I would say that. Thank you so much. Hey. Thank you.